welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Wagner and I have the privilege and pleasure of working with AEI. Carlin and I have known each other uh, for a decade now yes. and she comes from central Illinois, moved to DC and she is brilliant when it comes to all things policy, politics, impact of policy on politics, public opinion, I, everything. She has her hand on the pulse um, and she is collaborative and works with many, many, many people. Uh, uh, she did a, um, a Zoom on the 2020 election. I think that was in January or February and had close to 10,000 people tune in or some extraordinary number just to get her opinion. So all that being said, I'm going to stop talking. Um, all of us are, everybody on this call and those who are going to be watching it later are very interested in 2022, how the Supreme Court is going, Supreme Court leak is going to impact the election, Roe v. Wade impact on the election. Um, so if you have questions, put it in the chat when we open it up. And with that, take it away, Carly. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's wonderful to see you again. It's happy to be in the Midwest, even if it's virtual at this point. Um, I've been just enormously privileged to work at AI for a very long time. I've been there for more than 40 years, and I've been studying public opinion all that time and demographic change in the country. And I'm going to talk a little bit about things that I'm paying attention to as I look at the 2022 election. I'm going to start with a question that was asked in the polling world for the first time in 1973. It's one of the longest trends we have in survey research. And the question is pretty straightforward. Is the country on the right track or are we headed off in the wrong direction? And interestingly, the responses to that question are usually negative. But what I've noticed in the last year is the high level of sustained high level of negativity on that question. And I think it's no secret to any of you why that is. Um, we had five new polls yesterday and the day before, and the top issue by far was the economy, no question. And inflation, of course, is the issue that's of most concern to Americans right now. And we'll talk about abortion um, as I tick off a number of issues that I think we should pay attention to. But the inflation numbers are particularly significant. Um, the University of Michigan does, does a consumer sentiment index. They've been doing that since 1954. And they saw a big drop, a drop across the board, across demographic groups between the last, in the last two months overall in the sentiment index. And what I thought was particularly interesting was one of the components, which is the buying index, which had reached, which was at the lowest point since 1978 when they introduced that part of the index overall. So again, an enormous amount of pessimism. One of the polls yesterday from Quinnipiac found that 85% of um, Americans think the country is is headed for a recession. While there's a lot of blame to go around for inflation, um, this is the president's watch and Americans believe their presidents can do something about inflation. So that's a particularly strong negative as we look ahead to the 2022 elections. Biden's ratings on handling the economy are dangerously low, below 30% in some polls. Another one of the issues that came up in the new polls that came out this week, of course, was immigration. Um, I like to think of issues in an election year like the burners on a stove and you have some issues on the front burner at a full boil. And then you have a lot of other issues that are on the back burner. It's sort of a steady simmer and those can rise or fall at any particular time during an election campaign. And Title 42 is set to expire this weekend. Um, that's something that many moderate Democrats and most Republicans want the administration to continue. Um, that will be an interesting issue because Congress hasn't acted on it thus far. But it is um, immigration overall, uh, again, an issue that people care very deeply about. And in the latest poll from the Associated Press and the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, one of the best polls we have, um, the immigration issue in that poll, the Republicans had a 16 percentage point lead over the Democrats on managing border security. 
And so that was really, um, I thought, quite an impressive number. I've never seen anything like that. And when asked about immigration, what should the priorities be for the administration, more than half, and that was the highest response in the survey, said that increasing security at the border should be the administration's top concern. So that's there on the stove at a steady simmer. COVID, only about 9% of Americans see it as serious at this particular point. Um, 73% in the poll yesterday described it as a serious problem, but manageable. And here we've seen, this is one of the few areas where Biden's ratings have ticked up over time. Ratings of the federal government, ratings of the CDC have not moved. They've been very low for a long time, but Biden's ratings have ticked up ever, ever so slightly. A fall surge could certainly spell trouble for the administration, given the negative views of the government's handling and of the CDC. Crime. In Gallup's latest question, and they asked this a couple of weeks ago, uh, they found that concern about crime was higher than it had been at any time since 2016. Um, and there's a fatalism in the country about gun control. And one of the questions that the Economist YouGov poll asked this week, you found that a strong plurality said that more gun control would not have prevented the shooting in Buffalo and 31% said that it would. So again, another issue that comes back into the news on and off and it's, it could be important. The January 6th commission polling is quite interesting. Um, First of all, Americans very much want the federal government to continue the investigation. They're less confident in Congress in terms of the investigation. And I think the obvious reason is the deep partisan polarization in Congress. In one of the questions that the pollsters reported on yesterday, people were evenly divided 40 to 40 about, uh, about whether or not the Congressional Commission investigation would be fair or impartial. So that's something we're watching. Those hearings are going to become public pretty soon. And there's another leak this morning about something that may come out about members of Congress supposedly giving tours to some constituents who were people who were scoping out the joint, scoping out the Capitol. Um, Americans still believe that uh, Trump is culpable um, in terms of January 6th, but whether they want to go farther than that is unclear at this point. What was interesting in one of the polls yesterday was that 49%, nearly half of Americans said that the issue would have absolutely no impact on their vote in November. A few months ago, one of the pollsters, Quinnipiac, asked a question that hasn't been repeated, but the question asked whether or not um, uh, the, enough is already known about January 6th or whether more needs to be known and more work needs to be done. 48% of Democrats in that question said enough was already known about January 6th. So again, that puts the congressional investigation in, in some perspective um, overall. So that's something, another one of the things that I've been watching very closely. Um, and now finally, abortion. Um, I've probably done one of the most comprehensive surveys of abortion questions asked over the last 50 years. And it's one of the most interesting issues in public opinion. Public opinion broadly defined has three central properties. In many areas, you see just enormous continuity of attitudes. And in many areas, particularly in social on social issues, we've seen just an enormous amount of change. So those two properties are important. But then there's a third property. And I think this is what makes polls very difficult to interpret. And that is, in many areas, you see profound contradiction in public attitudes. We want the strong and assertive military, but we're always reluctant to put troops in harm's way. We want the federal government to get out of our lives, but at the same time, we want to be protected in terms of health and safety and those concerns overall. So you see these contradictions in our feelings. We want government to do a lot, but at the same time, we think big government is too intrusive. And right now we think it's pretty expensive, though there are not a lot of questions in the polling literature about that this year. Um, so abortion has two of those central properties in public opinion you see just enormous continuity. The major trends, Gallup started asking its question in 1975, and they ask a three-part question, should abortion always be legal? Should it be legal under some circumstances or should it be illegal? 
And that trend line, that question has been asked, I think, more than 70 times since 1975. The trend line is so stable, you can balance a glass of water on it. The numbers do not move. That's one of the two major kinds of questions that's asked about abortion. The other question is a four-part question asking whether it should be legal in all places, legal in some cases, illegal in some or illegal in all cases. And again, that trend line, remarkably stable for an incredibly long, for a 50 year period overall. You don't see that in many areas. But what makes the issue so difficult to interpret is the deep contradictions that many Americans have in their own hearts about the abortion issue. If you ask Americans, is abortion an act of murder? Most people say, yes, it is. But if you ask a different kind of question, should the decision to have an abortion be a personal choice between a woman and her doctor, Americans overwhelmingly say that it should be a personal choice. Those issues are in, obviously in very deep tension. It's murder, you know, I think it should be a personal choice. When that happens on a public policy issue, most people pull away from the issue. They don't see the gray. I mean, they, and that leaves a playing field to the activists who don't see the gray that most Americans see on this very, very difficult um, issue overall. So people are pulling away, but the activists are more active than ever. I am really loathe to comment on where I think the issue is going right now. When you've seen that kind of stability for 50 years, albeit with contradictions, it's just very hard to know what a major change in policy will do. Some people argue that this will be a much more important issue in governor's races than nationally in the fall. I think that there's certainly some indication that that might be the case. Um, regional differences in America in public opinion have largely disappeared, but they haven't disappeared on the issue of abortion. Massachusetts and Mississippi are very different. There are very few polls that look at individual state attitudes on abortion, in part because that's such an expensive thing for pollsters to do. But there are significant regional differences. As I said, Mississippi, this origin of the case that the court has heard um, is very different from Massachusetts. And already you see a lot of action at the state level. So it's possible that this issue could be a state issue, uh, more of a state issue, more of an issue in governor's races overall. It's hard, again, to look into the crystal ball on this issue. I also look very carefully at a question that Gallup has asked pretty regularly since 1996. Again, a lot of data on the question. The question asks whether or not abortion is the most important issue to you in casting your vote, whether it's one of many important issues or whether or not it's just not that important to you. And again, the trend has been completely stable since Gallup has asked that question. You have about 24 to 26% saying consistently that it is the most important issue to me in casting my vote. That has tended in the past to be a vote in the pro-life direction. More of those people say they're pro-lifers than pro-choicers overall. But the rest of the responses on that question, the vast majority of people are in the middle saying it's going to be one of a number of important issues to me um, in terms of my vote. And you still have about a quarter saying it's not important to me. It's not an issue on which I vote. We've had a couple of polls since the leak and we see an inversion of the kind that I've rarely ever seen in public opinion. If you look at all those earlier questions, and I'm thinking about a, a very good poll done by Bill McInturf, the GOP pollster, um, and Bill sent us all a bunch of slides about what he was seeing. And he looked at that question about single issue voting the last time they'd asked it, which was a while back. And he found that most of the groups who cared the most about the issue said it was going to be the most important issue to them were all Republican leaning groups. When they asked the question this time, the people who said that this was going to be the most important issue to them were all Democratic leaning groups. The issue has moved up a little in terms of its overall salience. I actually thought it might move up more since there's just been such an enormous amount of commentary on the decisions. But 
you know, not a huge number of Americans are paying attention. In every election year, of course, we always look at some key voter groups, and certainly one that we've looked at in recent elections is women in the suburbs. Um, and they obviously could be very important. I don't know a lot about where they're going on this issue right now, but I would make the point that they're very concerned about inflation. And it is not entirely clear to me what issue will trump what issue for different groups of voters overall. But apparently we're seeing at least some movement, some change in the coalition. Interestingly, the three or four pollsters since the leak who've asked the question, is it go are you going to be a single issue voter on abortion? The number is the same as it was before in the Gallup poll, about 20, 22%, 24% overall. Um, from January until the leak, Americans weren't paying very much attention to the issue overall. Economic issues were far more important to them. Um, there were small differences between Democrats, Republicans, and independents, and there were small differences between men and women. Historically, abortion has not divided the sexes. So the bottom line, I think, for most Americans is that they want to keep abortion legal, but they're willing to put very serious restrictions on its use. Again, a number of pollsters over the year have been looking at restrictions. And what we see is that Americans believe it should be possible to obtain a legal abortion in the first trimester. A majority favor that in the first trimester, but a majority opposes it in the second trimester and an even more substantial majority opposes third trimester abortions. There are a lot of other kinds of questions about circumstances. And I think the very best battery on circumstances, I mentioned the AP NORC poll at the University of Chicago. They began asking a question in 1972. They asked people uh, this, about the circumstances under which a woman should be able to obtain a legal abortion. And they asked about 10 or 11 different categories. They asked, should a woman be able to obtain a legal abortion in the case of rape? Overwhelming support for that. In the case of incest, overwhelming support for that. In the case of a serious health problem for the mother, overwhelming support for that. But if you ask questions about should a woman be able to obtain a legal abortion if she's not married and doesn't want to marry the man, if she thinks she has too many children, there the numbers are much closer. They're much more even divisions. What that battery of questions tells me is that when the circumstances of the pregnancy are under the woman's control, People have a very different attitude than when the circumstances of the pregnancy, rape, incest, health of the life of the mother, when the circumstances are not, are, are, are not under her control, there is strong support for legal abortion. So at this point, um, I wish I could give you a definitive answer about how it's going to play out this fall. Um, but that is where public opinion is on the issue overall. I wanted to say a few words about Donald Trump, about sort of his win-loss record thus far and where the public is on Donald Trump. I mentioned Bill McInturf's poll that came out this week, the Republican pollster, and he asked a question that he's been asking a lot over the past five or six years. And he asked some Americans, where, he, excuse me, he asked Republicans, this is a question asked only of Republicans. He asks Republicans whether or not they're more of a supporter of Donald Trump or more of a supporter of the Republican Party. And those numbers haven't moved very much until recently. And in the most recent question, again, the responses came out last week on that particular question. More than half said they were a supporter of the Republican Party, and a third said that they were more of a supporter of Donald Trump. But again, the numbers in the last couple of years have been pretty close on that particular question. Bill asked another question in that poll about whether or not Trump should be the leader of the Republican Party. And to that question, a majority of Republicans said, yes, Trump should be the leader of the Republican Party. So there's obviously tension on that question. But I think what that suggests is that a lot of people are just sort of waiting to make up their mind about candidates, about uh, the field, about the Republican field in 2024. That's obviously a very, very long way off. Trump has had a pretty mixed record thus far. And of course, there'll be some big races coming up in Georgia next week and also in Alabama. Um, 
And the record is mixed because the Trump campaign likes to tell people that they've had victory after victory after victory. But in many of those cases, there has been no competition in the race. There's only been one candidate. So therefore, it was, wasn't hard to miss it overall. But he lost ground in the Texas special election last year. Um, in Pennsylvania, one of his the people that he had um, decided or Sean Parnell had to leave the race in Nebraska. You saw the candidate that he had endorsed go down. In Ohio, he had four wins just two weeks ago. And in North Carolina, he was two for two. In West Virginia, his candidate Mooney won. And in Idaho, very big loss for Trump, who had endorsed late in the game a woman who was um, very, very considerably to the right in that state overall. So a very mixed record overall. There was a story in one of the cheat sheets I re read this morning saying that given everything that's happened with the Trump endorsements, that his team is saying that he might not endorse going forward. Um, that he might pull back in terms of the number of endorsements that he has had. But all of the things that I have been talking about, primarily the economy, President Biden's rating, and let me just say a word or two about that. Um, it's in the 39 to 41% range. That's a very dangerous zone. What we know in the modern era is that a candidate um, below 50% in terms of his approval rating usually loses about 35 to 39 seats. Now that's in the modern era, that's not a very big N, not a very big number of races that we're looking at overall, but it's still a very, I think, significant finding in the polls and a, a president above 50% because first off year elections are so difficult, um, loses a lot fewer st seats overall. So while I think that the Republicans will probably take the House, I feel more confident about that. I think the Senate is still a jump ball. And I provided a handout that looks at each of the races, just some basic information about the individual races. And I'm happy to talk about um, those overall. But I think that the reason you probably will not see a huge Republican pickup, as some are predicting, is because there are a lot fewer competitive seats now than there were um, in the last several elections. The deep partisan polarization has actually reduced the number of competitive seats. And um, as you're looking at redistricting um, overall, you, you understand what's happening in that picture. What I think, where I think Republicans might be successful and where they were just remarkably successful over the course of the Obama presidency was in the all important state legislative elections. Now abortion could change that. Um, abortion is such a wild card in this election overall. But during the Obama presidency, the GOP picked up 900 state legislative seats. They had at that point, I think, 27 what we call trifectas, where they controlled every major part of governments in all of those states, all three branches, the legislature and the executive overall. That is an enormously important advantage. The very first meeting that Barack Obama had at the end of his presidency, right after he left the White House, was, a, was with Eric Holder. And Holder was charged with forming a committee that would try to get the Democrats to do a better job at the state legislative race, in state legislative races. They have not been successful at that. And they're, they're trying again this time, and perhaps abortion will help in that overall. But today, the Republicans have 23 trifectas, just an enormous amount of power at the state and local level. So I think we may see some big gains there. And that's important because that's the farm team. Those are the people who are going to be running for Congress in a couple of years and then running for higher offices overall. And so I think that's a particularly important thing to, uh, to watch. Um, as I said, I think the Senate's a jump ball. Um, Senate races are much more decided on the basis of individual personalities of the candidates. And I think that will be the case once again. Governors, um, I've looked as closely at the governor's races at this particular point as I should, but you have some remarkably successful Republican governors. I can't see much change in Illinois, um, but you never know. You never know in a big year, I suppose that could be possible. But again, I'm not as sure as many people are that it'll be a big year for the Republicans. I've covered a lot of ground. Uh,
Um, I'm happy to take your questions and um, happy to talk about any of the issues I've discussed or whatever's on your mind about the elections. Thank you so much. If you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, we had one question texted in um, and it goes back uh, to what you said about uh, suburban women and the concern about the economy. When you, um, based on the data, what you see from polling women in all these years and many of the suburban races all over the country, and you look at the, the tea leaves and the data from your years of history, do you see the economy and the concern for schools having greater concern and uh, greater weight than maybe some of the um, abortion social issues just because they're so close to home um, as opposed to what the, what the left would like to say that it's all about women or it's all about the choice issue and Republicans or Neanderthals or whatever they're going to say? Right now, the economy is so potent. Um, I think we just had uh, not enough time has elapsed yet um, since the leak, and we don't really know what this final decision is going to be. But I mean, certainly some suburban women are going to be energized by the decision. But and it's hard to say what trumps what right now. But certainly, uh, in, in the governor's races, state and local issues, school issues, which have just zoomed up as they did in the Yunkin race in, in Virginia, um, have been very important. It's, it's really probably premature to say what trumps what with these suburban women. They're an incredibly important voting block. And thinking back, um, uh, one of my colleagues, um, when I came to AI, I worked for a guy named Ben Wattenberg, who wrote a book with um, the former director of the census, who was also an AI colleague named Richard Scammon. And they wrote a book called The Real America, it was an enormously popular book at the time. And they identified the person who was going to be, they were the very first authors to ever identify a group that was going to be key to the election. And they found the Dayton housewife. She was in the middle of the country and Ohio's still pretty darn important. She had a mid-level education, a mid-level income. She was married, she lived in Dayton. And she became so popular that at that point, the Johnny Carson show sent a team of interviewers to Dayton to try to find this mythical woman. So she was on the Johnny Carson show. I mean, I don't, I confess, I don't remember that, but she had her long cigarette holder and she was the first key group of women in an election. And since that time, we've had a lot of other groups of women that have been thought to be very important and suburban women um, are certainly a key group that we'll be looking at. One of the interesting findings, I'm just going to talk about a couple of other groups that I'm watching. Um, Hispanics. In Bill McInturff's poll, the GOP poll, which is very highly regarded across the board by Democrats and Republicans, he saw not GOP with an advantage among Hispanics, but certainly having gained just enormous ground, surprisingly an enormous ground. And we saw, of course, different patterns in Texas um, and in Florida in the last presidential election. It's hard to talk about Hispanics as a single group because of course the patterns of assimilation are very different. Venezuelans and Cubans in Florida are very different from Mexican Americans on the Mexican American border. But there's something that I think a lot of people are missing in terms of thinking about the Hispanic vote going forward. A huge percentage of the Hispanics who will be voting in our elections are now second or third generation Hispanic Americans. Um, they have very different views than first generation Hispanics, very different views. And is in a poll that Gallup had done in the 1990s, but immigration generally, I mean, it took them three years to build a sample of immigrants. That's how hard it is to do to do first, second and third generation um, Americans. When you're doing a poll, it's just prohibitively expensive. And they found out the third generation immigrants at that point, not Hispanics, but immigrants at that point wanted to roll up the welcome mat. Very different attitudes. And I think that's what you're beginning to see in some places in Texas is the effect of this third generation. If you look at the, if you look at the third generation of Hispanics, many do not speak Spanish. Um, and the question for demographers who've been looking so closely at this over time is whether or not um, 
it will be a monolithic vote in the way that African African Americans are, and I think the answer to that is no, because the African American experience is so distinct, or whether or not they'll meld into the population as Irish and others have done over time, and I think that's probably more likely going forward. So that's a group that I think we need to look at very carefully going forward. Um, and we will see. There was a question in the chat room about the difference between men and women. Historically, there on, on the issue of abortion, historically there have been very small differences between men and women on this issue. This issue. Um, women appear to be more energized now on the issue overall, but on, on all the questions I've been mentioning, whether it's murder, whether it should be a personal choice, again, men and women do not differ significantly. <coughs> Follow-up question um, on that uh, from Tony, Tony down in Florida. Sorry. Um, yeah, do, what do you see in the, in the recent abortion polling regarding the 18 to 29 demographic? Yeah. Or roughly that age? Well, that's a, that's a very important group to watch. And, um, what I don't see is um, an especially high level of enthusiasm about voting. As you know, in off-year elections, voting tends to decline a lot after presidential elections. And even though every, even though many commentators expected young people to vote in significantly high portions in 2020, it turns out they a lot more of them did vote. But in fact, they look pretty much like everyone else and they were much less likely to um, be voting than older Americans. So that longstanding age pattern overall, but still it's really important to see whether an issue such as abortion could energize them. They are more liberal on the issue of abortion. They're more liberal on the issue of the environment. Um, they're a little less liberal, interestingly, than baby boomers on legalization of marijuana. Um, they are... I think we've heard a lot about their views about socialism and capitalism and young people tend to try on a lot at a very young age and then they shed some of those views as they get older. Um, but at this point, um, I, I just want to ask myself, will they in fact turn out in record numbers? It could be important in some places um, overall. Uh, the oldest millennials are now over 40. Um, so you see the age structure of the population changing a great deal. But it's, it is important to watch that 18 to 29 year old group. And they are more liberal on the issue of abortion, but not on all social issues. Thank you. If you, Thank you. Uh, if you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, we had a one texted in, what do you see in the changing um, changing environment and the polling about concern for climate change and things like that, the environment? Yeah, climate is an issue I, I should have mentioned in the introduction just to talk about views. Um, Americans believe it's real. They believe the kind of um, uh, difficult weather events that we've had all over the country are caused by climate change. They're concerned about that. But most Americans are passive environmentalists. They're willing to do what's easy, but it's not clear that they're willing to do what's hard. Um, and certainly we've seen in the, and we should talk a little about Ukraine too, but certainly what we've seen with gas prices escalating is that Americans do want more drilling here uh, generally, and uh, more oil production here. And so the idea that we would be able to move away from fossil fuels um, in any immediate Biden-like parameter, I don't think is very realistic for the American people. And gas prices, um, you can, if you think about people who are blaming the administration for inflation, you could conceivably say that gas prices have some relation to what's going on in Ukraine. But if you look at food and energy, food prices and, and other kinds of prices, it's not, it's not as clear cut, but Americans do want to drill more right now. Um, uh, only about, I think here's, here's a good point of comparison. As I said, you've got roughly 22, 25% of Americans saying that abortion is the most important issue to them in casting their vote, an issue that could go a different way. But the 
environment vote historically has been only about 3%. Now, those people are very passionate about the issue, but it doesn't have the overall weight. I think that is changing and it will have greater weight over time. Unfortunately, the exit pollsters haven't included the environment or abortion in their questions for many years about what's the most important issue to you in casting your vote because other issues have, have had greater salience overall. So climate is something to watch, um, but it's and it's coming up now in the top five issues that people are concerned about. Um, that's something that's fairly new in the last, let's say, five years. It was usually farther down um, in the in the order overall. But it is important to watch young people in particular on that issue. Mark Newman has a question. Uh Yes, thanks, Lisa, and thanks for, for all your work on this. I wondered uh, what impact, if any, would the war in Ukraine have on the midterm elections, uh, assuming on one hand it just kind of stays like it is right now, or on another hand it uh, greatly escalates? You have in the polls and these hypothetical questions, well, what if, I, what if Putin uses nuclear weapons? What if Putin uses um, chemical weapons? And uh, you have right now about a quarter of Americans who are very afraid of that. And it's possible that it could escalate. The pattern has been very clear. Americans want to give as much help as possible. I think it's quite possible. Um, Americans don't want to send troops. Uh, they're always reluctant to put troops in harm's way. But uh, at least at this point, again, different from Republicans in Congress, where you had um, a considerable number of Republicans opposing the latest, um, the latest <clears throat> Uh, tranche of money for the Ukrainians. But at this point, um, Americans uh, are just willing to watch the situation overall. Afghanistan had a profound effect on, on uh, Joe Biden overall, and it caused people to doubt his leadership in foreign affairs. And uh, that has been very, very significant. And that's had an impact on Ukraine overall, but rank and file, Republicans, Democrats, independents are supportive of what the administration has done thus far. Thank you. Can you speak to the black vote and Trump and Black Lives Matter? Yeah. Um, the black vote is one of the few monolithic votes that we have in American politics, overwhelmingly democratic, whereas um, Hispanic vote is about two thirds Democratic nationally, though that may be changing ever so slightly. It's going to take time to change that over time, whereas the Black vote is monolithically Democratic and Black women are much more active than our Black men. Blacks tend to be more conservative on the issue of abortion. That's been historically true. Um, I don't see a lot of evidence at this point that uh, Trump is breaking into the, that Republicans are breaking into the black vote. I think it's, it's obviously very important um, to think about that in the future. Young African-Americans are not more Republican. They are much more independent. Democrats have lost young African-Americans and Biden's support is still very high among African-Americans, whereas among Democrats as a whole, it's now down to about 76% approval. That's really dangerously low for the, for the Democrats overall. Um, and it, um, I mean, Republicans do need, need, need to make inroads in the Hispanic vote over time and also in the African-American vote. Demography isn't destiny but it's pretty important to watch those aging patterns. Particularly important, I think, is a phenomenon we call in demography, the browning of the gray. That is the new ethnic diversity among the senior population. And so Republicans need to pay more attention. What's I think going to be very interesting this fall is it's, it's conceivable Republicans are going to elect a, a, a very significant number of very attractive black, Democratic congressman um, who can be the face of the party on a number of issues, a new generation. And I think you that's mean black great. Republican congressman. Yes, black Republican congressman. And so that's something that we're watching closely. And I think that could be very, very important to have some new faces for the party on those issues overall. But it is a monolithically Democratic vote, um, and particularly black women more so than black men. If you're seeing any erosion, it's among black men. So. 
and Black Lives Matter. Uh, the police took a hit after George Floyd, um, but now views of the police have returned to what they were prior to the George Floyd killing, um, whereas Black Lives Matter has lost an enorm enormous amount of ground. Thank you. And our final um, question comes from Mark Cabers. Mm -hmm. If I went correctly, Mark? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, doing this. And I was just wondering, you know, locally, we just hear about for our side talking about like crime, inflation, taxes, corruption. Uh, our Democrat Governor Pritzker tweets about abortion, you know, 30 times in the last month. And so like thinking about it from the other side, what would you be advising them to prevent us from having a, a great year? And if you have time, I guess my my two part question, if that's OK, would oh, be sure. um, I think like over the last four or five years, we've seen kind of like the nationalization of these local races. Is that something that you see continuing or in 2021 with Virginia, is that like attacked back to having some local, like local focus? Cause I think the local focus is good for us in Illinois, but you know, either of those questions, your uh, thoughts would be appreciated. Sure. Um, if I were a Democrat, I guess I'd, 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 I mean, you can see what the Biden administration is trying to do to run against radical mega Republicans overall, putting that face on the entire party. And that's, that's certainly what they're trying to do. And they're also, um, I mean, Biden's trying to say that things are going to get better by the summer. Uh, the public will be a lagging indicator, even if the inflation numbers improve over the course of the summer. The uh, public always lags on an issue like inflation, particularly women. They're less likely to be, believe in fundamental change. So they're trying to nationalize the race. And what they'll continue to point to is uh, some of the more extreme or possibly extreme Republican candidates overall. So they're, they're trying very much to nationalize the race. And um, I think the Yunkin victory in my state, um, my adopted state, my new state, um, it was very significant in terms of the way that he ran, concentrating on local issues, being sensitive to the emergence of things such as critical race theory, which don't have a large national public following. But parents' responsibility for their children's education is just an incredibly potent issue. So you'll see a lot more of that at the local level. So whether they'll be successful in nationalizing the race remains to be seen, but that's the way they're going to try to do it is by talking about radical MAGA Republicans. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is 8.45. Thank you, everybody, for your participation today in this morning's Coffee and Conversation. If you would like a recording of this, please contact Ellie, um, who you all met before. Carlin, you're awesome. I promise you, you're going to be back. Um, thank you for your brain. Thank you for your great work. Thank you for your insight. Just, just really appreciate all the great work that you do. Um, and everybody, your support helps make Carlin's work possible. Carlin, and your closing remarks? Well, I should say how, how greatly privileged I've been to be at AI all these years. It is a truly wonderful institution. And I think we put um, our work on public opinion on the map over the last couple of decades and people take it very seriously. And I'm we're, we're very grateful for your support. Um, and it, the think tank world is an interesting space to be in these days. Um, you've seen a lot of changes. And at some point, Lisa, maybe we could have a talk about uh, one of these talks about just changes in the think tank world in the last uh, 50 years, because that's, that's an interesting story too. But again, I'm delighted I could do this this morning. I apologize for the glitch. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, in any case, thank you. Thank you so much um, for everything you do for AI. We're very grateful for that. And I hope all of you have a lovely weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.